to introduce the concept of convergence of sequences. Let's recap some ideas from before. I'd like to focus on the following motivating question so we can get an idea of some sequences that we'll study today. Say that we have a home loan for $10,000, which accrues at an annual percentage rate of 12% compounded monthly. How much will we have to pay per month if we wish to pay off the loan in four years? To answer this question, we'll need to set up some notation. We'll let N denote the number of months after the loan is acquired. X sub N is the amount of the loan after N months. Rho is the factor by which the loan amount increases due to interest and B will be the amount we'll pay each month. So far we know from what's given here in the problem that we have the following recursive relation. Initially, our loan amount is X0, which is $10,000. The ratio, the factor by which the loan amount increases, is 1.01. .01. That's because we have 12% APR over 12 months. And we have this recursive relation that xn plus 1 is rho times xn plus b. We want x sub n to be 0 when n is 48 because this corresponds to 48 months, that is 4 years. The point is that we'll need to solve for b. Here's a closed form expression coming from our recursive relation. x sub n is rho to the n times x0 plus 1 minus rho to the n divided by 1 minus rho times b. Again, going back to our question, how much do we have to pay off per month if we'd like for this loan to go be gone after four years? We'll basically plug in n is 48, rho is 1.01, .01, x0 is 10,000 to find that x sub n should be 0. Solving for b, we'll see that we must pay off at least $263.34 each month. What's most important here is the statement at the very top, the formula that we have for our x sub n. Let's make a few observations. Let's take a look at the sequence capital A coming from the terms here at the top of the slide. If rho is greater than 1, then we'll see that our sequence increases without bound. That is, the set A is not a bounded set. On the other hand, if rho is between 0 and 1, then rho to the n gets arbitrarily small. In this case, our set capital A is a bounded set so that we have a bounded sequence. There are other sequences though where the behavior is a little bit strange. Let's consider the sequence on the screen called the logistic equation. Here, x sub n plus one is rho times xn times one minus xn. We'd like to know whether we can predict the behavior of the sequence as n increases without bound. If rho is between 1 and 3, then we do have a bounded sequence, and actually our, rho, our xn tends to rho minus 1 divided by rho as n increases without bound. On the other hand, if rho is between 3 and 1 plus the square root of 6, which is about 3.4, then our sequence oscillates between two limiting values. Finally, if rho is equal to 4, we actually find chaotic behavior. That is, we cannot predict the behavior of the terms in our sequence. We'll come back to these examples later on in the course. We're going to use these ideas to introduce the concept of convergence of sequences. To this end, let's say that f is a complete ordered field, such as the real numbers. Recall that a sequence is simply a set consisting of the numbers x0, x1, x2, and so forth, where we have a collection of numbers that are indexed by the non-negative integers n. We'll say that our sequence converges to a number l if, given any positive epsilon, we can find a delta such that in absolute value xn minus l is less than epsilon whenever n is greater than delta. The intuition here is that as n increases without bound, our sequence gets very, very close to the number l. We'll use the notation you see here on the screen to describe this. Either we'll say xn arrow l, meaning xn tends to l, 
or we'll say the limit as n increases without bound of xn equals L. Either of these notations means the statement here in terms of epsilon and delta. We'll say that our sequence increases without bound if, given any positive epsilon, we can find a delta such that xn is greater than epsilon whenever n is greater than delta. In this case, we'll say that xn tends to infinity, or the limit as xn of xn as n increases without bound equals infinity. Similarly, we'll say that our sequence decreases without bound if it tends to negative infinity. Rigorously, here we'll say, given any positive epsilon, we can find a delta such that xn is less than negative epsilon whenever n is greater than delta. We'll say that our sequence diverges if it either increases or decreases without bound. The intuition here is that the terms, either plus or minus xn, become very, very large. We'd like to say, given an epsilon, which is arbitrarily large, we can go out as far as we need to in the sequence x sub n's to make our x sub n's, an absolute value, greater than delta, greater than epsilon. Finally, we'll say that our sequence does not converge if it neither converges nor diverges in the sense of increasing without bound or decreasing without bound. Let's try to go over a couple of examples to discuss a little bit more detail what's going on here. Again, say that we have a complete ordered field. Consider a sequence capital A defined by x sub n as x0 plus n times b, where b is a non-zero element. We claim that this sequence diverges. We'll show that A is not a bounded set by considering two different cases depending upon the sign of this element B. First, let's say that our epsilon positive is given. Next, let's choose delta in the following ways. Notice that delta, x, delta satisfies x0 plus delta B equals positive epsilon if b is greater than zero, or this is equal to negative epsilon if b is less than zero. We'll explain why in a moment we've made these choices for delta. The point is, we're going to show that either x sub n is greater than epsilon, for n is greater than delta, or we'll show that x sub n is less than negative epsilon, for n is greater than delta. This will depend upon the sign of b. To this end, let's choose any natural number n satisfying n greater than delta. If b is positive, then n times b is greater than delta times b, which means that our x sub n is greater than epsilon. In other words, this sequence does indeed increase without bound. On the other hand, let's say that b is less than zero then this means that n times b is less than delta times b, so actually x sub n is less than negative epsilon. In other words, this sequence decreases without bound. Note as a remark that we stated our choice of delta immediately after epsilon was given. We simply made a guess that what might work in our case is x sub delta equals epsilon, and then we solve for delta accordingly. However, notice that we did not explain how we came to find this delta. This is one of the oddities of our construction here. Notice that we have to say, let epsilon positive be given, then we state delta, and then we work through a proof to explain why that choice of delta works. These will always be the three parts of our proof. Let's do this in a second example. In this case, let's let f be the real numbers and let's consider a sequence defined as we started the lesson with. x sub n is rho to the n times x0 plus 1 minus rho to the n divided by 1 minus rho times b. I can write this in a very specific form using this quantity L, which is b divided by 1 minus rho. The claim is this sequence converges to L as long as rho is between 0 and 1. For the proof, we'll go through the same three steps as before. First, we'll have an initialization. That is, we'll state right away, let epsilon positive be given. Next, we'll need to state a delta. 
But before we do that, let's have a quick aside to discuss how we might want to choose a delta. What we're going to do is attempt to set in absolute value x delta minus l equal epsilon. To do so, since we know that x sub n is l plus quantity times rho to the n, we can use all of this and then write down some logarithms to write down a delta that should work. But there are a couple of issues here. For example, what happens when x0 equals l? In this case, you see that the log of the absolute value of x0 minus l doesn't make any sense. We can't take the log of 0. And how do we define the logarithm if we're dealing with an arbitrary complete ordered field, namely one that's not equal to the real numbers? The point is that the delta that we're choosing in this case seems to work out very nicely when f is the real numbers, but we'll have to come up with a slightly different proof when f is not. We'll use this choice of delta now to break up into two cases. Here's how we're going to choose delta. If x0 equals l, let's choose delta to be 0. Otherwise, if x0 does not equal to l, we'll choose the delta that we had on the previous slide. Notice that in either case, we're choosing delta such that the absolute value of x0 minus l times rho to the delta equals epsilon. Now, let's choose any n natural number satisfying n greater than delta. We have two cases to consider. First case, let's assume that x0 equals l. The way that we've chosen things means that xn is equal to l for all natural numbers n. This means an absolute value, xn minus l, is equal to 0, which is always less than epsilon. According to our definitions, xn tends to l. On the other hand, let's say that x0 does not equal to l. Since the difference at n minus delta is a natural number, that is, it's a non-negative integer, then we see that rho to the n minus delta has to be less than 1. In particular, rho to the delta is actually larger than rho to the n whenever n is greater than delta. In absolute value, then, xn minus l has to be less than, in absolute value, x0 minus l times rho to the delta. And remember how we chose delta from above. This here is equal to epsilon. The whole point is that we've chosen our delta just to make our life a little bit simple. Hence, in absolute value, xn minus l is less than epsilon, which means, by our definition, xn tends to l. Thanks for listening.